truth has nothing to do with the number of people who are convinced of it. If you are 40 years or older, you may remember January 28, 1986. It was the day of a huge NASA catastrophe off the coast of Cape Canaveral, Florida, where at 11.38 a.m. EST, 73 seconds after takeoff, Space Shuttle Challenger exploded in a tremendous burst over the Atlantic. All seven crew members were killed, five NASA astronauts and the two payload specialists. Millions of Americans, 17% of the total population, were watching the launch live on TV due to payload specialist Krista McAuliffe, the first teacher in space. The media coverage of the explosion was extensive. A study reveals that 85% of the Americans questioned had heard of the accident within the hour. The whole world was in a state of shock and the whole world mourned and took part in the funerals of the space shuttle victims. The failure of an O-ring gasket of the right-hand side solid fuel booster was the cause of the explosion. The shuttle did not dispose of an ejector seat system and the impact on the ocean surface was too severe for anyone to survive. The catastrophe led to a 32-month pause in the NASA shuttle program and by appointment of President Ronald Reagan, the Rogers Commission was created a special committee to investigate the accident. These are the names of the seven crew members of the Challenger. First, Francis Richard Scobie, commander. Second, Michael John Smith, pilot. Third, Ronald McNair, mission specialist. Fourth, Alison Onazuka, mission specialist. Fifth, Judith Resnick, mission specialist. Sixth, Gregory Jarvis, payload specialist. Seventh, Krista McAuliffe, payload specialist. And now, the unbelievable. A well-known proverb says, if something looks like a duck, sounds like a duck, and behaves like a duck, then it probably is a duck. For a second time, this matter leaves the world breathless. Though this latest shock even surpasses the one 30 years ago. At least six of the seven Challenger crew members are supposed to be alive still. Four of them, even with the same name. Here is the evidence to review. First, Francis Richard Scobie, commander of the Space Shuttle Challenger. Francis Richard Scobie, born May 19, 1939, commander of the Space Shuttle Challenger. Exactly 30 years after the Challenger crashed, he was spotted as a CEO of Cows and Trees, which was and today still is a marketing advertising agency in Chicago. When you take a look at these two pictures, you can see at least three features that show a strong resemblance. First, the same high forehead and the same eyebrows and also the eyes facing slightly downwards at their outer corners. And all this always with his middle name Richard and the same age. You can find the picture on the right side also on his LinkedIn page. When visiting the Cows and Trees website, which I've opened here, you come across an animation with a rocket-driven cow. And the dust swirled around forms the number 6. The whole thing reminds strongly the Space Shuttle Challenger on TV when it exploded in midair. Just how black would such a humor be? Second, Michael J. Smith, pilot of the Challenger. Born on the 13th of April in 1945, pilot of the Challenger. 
Michael J. Smith, 41 years old when he lost his life 30 years ago because of the explosion. The man on the picture to the right also bears the name Michael John Smith and he's exactly 30 years older now. The resemblance with the astronaut Michael John Smith is striking. The same horizontal eyebrows, the same grey-blue eyes, the same vertical indentation on the tip of his nose. We are talking of an emeritus professor for industry and system engineering at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Michael John Smith's email address is mjsmith at k.wisc.edu. Third, Ronald McNair, mission specialist of the Challenger. Born on October 21, 1950, Ronald McNair was the second Afro-American astronaut with a doctor's degree in physics. The 66-year-old Carl McNair on the right looks just as Ronald would look today. One day this fact attracted the attention of some American citizens. When addressing him about the astonishing resemblance, it is said that he responded spontaneously that he was the twin brother of the killed astronaut. As the resemblance was more than striking in every aspect, some fellow citizens began to doubt this assertion. Because they did not just want to put out empty allegations, they began to investigate. Previously, it was not known that the late Ronald McNair had a twin brother. However, there was a lot to discover about Carl McNair. For example, that he is an author, an educational consultant and an inspired speaker. That he is the founder and retired president of the Ronald E. McNair Foundation, which he had established in honor of his deceased brother. One detail, however, could not be clarified at the time of that investigation. There are no indications for a twin brother of Ronald McNair named Carl from before 1986. Here's the report of the research of a free journalist. On Ancestry.com I have performed a search for a Carl McNair who claims to be the brother of the astronaut Ronald McNair. Carl S. McNair's LinkedIn page mentions December 16th as his birthday. On Wikipedia Ronald McNair's parents are Carl C. and Pearl M. McNair. So I searched industry.com for any birth or baptism records for a Carl McNair born on December 16th whose father is Carl McNair and Pearl McNair his mother. Search results. In the birth certificates of Texas between 1903 and 1932 there is only the record of Herschel John McNair born on October 12th in Roosevelt, Upshur, whose father his name was William McNair and his mother's was Pearl McNair. In other words, according to Ancestry.com, there is no Carl McNair, brother of Ronald McNair. Here is the screenshot of the respective page of Ancestry.com with a timestamp in the lower right hand corner. 10.18 am on 5th of September 2015, circled in red. Just to make sure, I redid the search for Carl McNair. This time I have limited the search to Carl McNair with a father named McNair and a mother called Pearl. I found no Carl McNair whose father's last name was McNair and whose mother's first name was Pearl. Fourth, Alison Onizuka, Mission Specialist of the Challenger. Another Mission Specialist of the Challenger, Alison Onizuka, was the first Japanese-American astronaut. He too was supposed to have shown up in public after the Challenger catastrophe. When asked how on earth he could still be alive, he supposedly defended himself pretending to be clawed the twin brother of the deceased astronaut Alison Onizuka. As his assertion was not seen to be credible, some fellow citizens set out for research about a twin brother of the astronaut. The astronaut Alison Onizuka was born in Hawaii on the 24th of June. At the time of that research, there was no birth register containing a twin brother Claude. Claude allegedly claimed to be the younger brother of Alison Onizuka. If Alison was still alive today, he would look exactly like his younger brother Claude on this picture. The same eyebrows, same eyes, 
same crow's feet wrinkles, same nose, even the same hair parting. Claude Onizuka is a board member of the Department of Liquor Control, County of Hawaii, Hilo, Hawaii. Resulting from another more extensive research by an eyewitness. I also asked Ancestry.com to search for the birth records of a Claude Onizuka, the alleged brother of the astronaut Alison Onizuka. According to Wikipedia's entry on Alison Onizuka, his father was the late lamented Masamitsu Onizuka. His mother is Mitsu Onizuka. Result of the search? Your search for Claude Onizuka returned zero good matches. Here's the screenshot of the birth register. Just to be sure, I redid the search for Claude Onizuka, this time without specifying the names of the parents. There were 36 results, none of which was Claude Onizuka. In other words, according to Ancestry.com at the time of this research, no one named Claude Onizuka had ever been born in the United States. Fifth, Judith Resnick, Mission Specialist of the Challenger. Judith Arlene Resnick, born on April 5, 1949. What of importance can be said about her? With a PhD in electrical engineering, she was a mission specialist of the Challenger. She was the second female American astronaut and the first Jewish American astronaut to fly in space. And now comes the interesting part. At Yale Law School, there is a chair held by a professor named Judith Resnick. The same name, this may occasionally happen. However, not only is it remarkable that now she is exactly 30 years older than the astronaut Judith Resnick when she was killed. She has exactly the same name, the same appearance and the same voice as the deceased astronaut. And what is she doing at the Yale Law School? She is a professor of law for the Arthur Lehman program. Now let's return to compare the pictures. Like the astronaut Judith Resnick, this professor has dark curly hair, dark eyes, the same shaped eyebrow, and the same lines on both sides of the face extending up from the jaw. What else can we see? Their mouth, the way they look and their gestures are exactly the same. Here is another picture to compare. Look here at her mouth. The upper lip of both Judith Resnick's form a slight peak when they speak. Do you see this? And is all this at random or coincidental? Here and after, two elaborate investigations are presented about Judith Resnick as witness reports. Whoever compares the voices of astronaut Judith Resnick 30 years ago, along with Professor Judith Resnick, comes to the conclusion it's about one and the same woman. So let's finally listen to this voice comparison. Judith Resnick before and after 30 years. Well, I too am glad to be here one more time, and uh, I am hoping that the, the uh, affliction that Steve Hawley had from the 41D mission, mission specialist of the delays, hasn't rubbed off on me. And there I think were fewer than 40 federal judges around the United States, and they didn't need a building of their own. They were tucked into facilities like this, and of course what the U.S. government did was this was a form of tax and marine hospitals health care. I think the guys behind me are hoping that it hasn't also Otherwise, they what might happens, throw of me course, out. is the Civil War, and with the Civil War and the North conquest but of the also, South. Otherwise, they might throw me off the flight. The U.S. federal government owned about, and I will now introduce about 50 buildings, Ellen, Ellen is around the entire hoping that it has, the United States. They might States. throw me, and me off none the, of the flight. Of our flight. <laughs> Are all these inconsistencies pure coincidences, or is it about a worldwide deception of enormous proportions? One must not mistake the majority for the truth. 
Sixth, Sharon Krista McAuliffe, payload specialist of the Challenger. On September 2nd, 1948, Sharon Krista McAuliffe was born. She too was one of the astronauts killed on the Challenger. She was a teacher for social studies at Concord High School in New Hampshire, where she was selected from more than 11,000 applicants to participate in the NASA project Teacher in Space. If the Challenger had not exploded, she would have been the first teacher in outer space. Had she not died in the Challenger disaster, McAuliffe would be 68 years old today. In the course of the research about the space shuttle deception, also for Sharon McAuliffe, apparently an exact double was found with the same looks and, believe it or not, with the same name. Even considering the 30 added years, this exceptional professor of law at Syracuse University looks exactly the same as the astronaut McAuliffe. But not only does she look identical, but she is also exactly the same age. Note also the details, for example how her hair growth extends from the center of her hairline to the left of her forehead. The same lawyer, Sharon A. McAuliffe, who works for Syracuse Law School in New York State, is also a cousin of Virginia's governor, Terry McAuliffe. And he, in turn, had supported the re-election of Clinton and the election of his wife, Hillary, as her campaign chairman. Furthermore, he stood up for the support of NASA, in particular for the matter of the rocket launching site on Wallops Island, Virginia, in the Atlantic Ocean. In all these researches, it is important to state that it would be one thing if a single crew member of the Challenger would resemble to a person still alive. That could be dismissed as a mere coincidence. But it is quite a different thing if six members from one and the same Challenger crew have a look-alike, living in one and the same country and in not less than four cases even have the same name. The rough guess of a physics teacher is summarizing this probability with the following figures and illustrations. By using a binomial distribution, one can ascertain how likely it is that an event with this probability occurs four times within ten years. Roughly guessed, this leads to a probability of about 10 raised to the power of minus 160. For comparison, the probability of being hit from space debris is indicated by computing experts with a probability of about 6 times 10 raised to the power of minus 13. So it is more likely to be hit by some comet fragments 7 times in your life than such a collection of lookalikes would come about. But probably this figure is even much higher. What kind of people would the NASA be composed of if they are able to lie deliberately and to bluff a whole world for more than 30 years? After all, the NASA is an institution which is devouring multi-digit billion dollar amounts of tax money and private donations every year. What does it mean if not less than four elite universities would be involved only in the worldwide space shuttle fraud? The following questions must be absolutely clarified. Who else could be involved into this fraud? Considering all the astronauts presumed dead would then be found as lawyers, jurists, financial experts, etc. So if the entire NASA, astronauts and professors of law, in other words, elite instructors of teachers, etc. would be involved in a global fraud, who else in addition to that? Where is the seventh astronaut, Gregory Jarvis? Is he still alive? For the clarification of all these endless questions, humanity depends upon its own help. Whoever is capable to help is welcome to participate in the clarification of all the problems addressed in this film. According to eyewitness reports from NASA insiders, the NASA did not only lie in some ways, but in every way. A NASA insider reveals. When I was talking with the gentleman from Belcom and, and we were discussing uh, the lie, everything he was telling me was different from what we were being told uh, was the truth. And at one point I asked him, I said, man, you guys 
you, you lied about a lot, didn't you? And instantly he said, no, we didn't lie about certain things. We lied about everything. None of it was true. Repeatedly in their advertisement films, NASA boasted that their space flights created jobs, first of all in the industry. But now the most urgent question is this, which jobs in exactly which industry? At least in the spaceflight industry, various NASA astronauts were not taking an active part during the great moon or space shuttle flights. So a NASA insider recently claimed that he cannot take part anymore for his conscience sake in the whole worldwide deception as he calls it. He says that the NASA does not lie to the world only in some aspects, but in every single aspect. Because of similar testimonies of other NASA insiders, freelance journalists took a kind of a crucial test. With a Bible in their hand, they placed themselves in front of all these famous hyped astronauts and let them swear on the Bible that they really had been on the moon and had not been lying to the world. But listen and watch for yourself. And like this, all astronauts reacted when being asked. You want me to knock you in the head? Well, I want you to, I want you to swear to Get God on the Bible me. that you walked on the moon. If you walked on the moon, we're given the opportunity to swear to God that you walked on the moon. I'm going to give you the opportunity to get the hell knocked out of you if you don't leave me alone. So why don't you just put the end to the record in the argument and put your hand on the Bible, swear to God you walked on the moon. Mr. Cyril, yeah. knowing you, that's probably a fake Bible. You really like it, don't you? You're the one who said you walked on the moon when you didn't. Calling the kettle black, if I ever thought of it. Saying I misrepresented myself. Get it away myself. from me. You're a coward and a liar and a thief. You're a coward and a liar. You're a coward and a liar. The Earth well, you're seven. talking to the wrong guy. Why don't you, you talk to the administrator in NASA? Inside. We're passengers. We're, we're guys going on a flight. I don't hit people, but you're going to be on the deck unless you get the hell out. I appreciate it. Get the hell out of the house. Well, I take your stuff and get the fuck out. Why don't you quote me and say it's bullshit? I'm in the shadows in Iraq. I don't give a, I don't give a damn about all that shit. It's a full of shit of lunar orbit being falsified. Being falsified? Correct. We've got an unedited tape from a source at That's the Johnson nonsense. Space Center. Yes, totally I nonsense. Did. Mr. Seibel, you do not deserve answers. If you show this publicly, you're open for a lawsuit. Okay? All these reactions also endorse the suspicion that there seems to be something really fishy in the whole of NASA operations. What were all these astronauts staying during their faint space missions? And what are the objectives pursued? Were they only on vacation at the expense of taxpayers and investors? Probably not. But which are the imaginings all these people are realizing during their world-famous moon and space flights when they are not on board of a rocket? Therefore, the world public would have to ask the following questions. How many pictures taken by NASA are actually real? Which of the pictures are faked? Is the entire scientific worldview incorrect? Which branches of science are lying as well? Where went all those trillions of dollars of donations and tax money if it was not used for the pretended purpose? Which mass media are involved? Had the mass media been fooled or are they part of the fraud? Which global corporations are also involved? What about the moon if the whole story of the moon landing has been faked? What number of government bodies, legal institutions, military people and secret services are part of it? How many universities, faculties, law schools, economic sectors and so on are involved? Klagemauer TV thanks you in advance for all relevant information.